Uh, my name is Avery Weinman. I'm a PhD student um, in the UCLA Department of History, and I'm the Harry C. Sigmund Graduate Fellow here at the Nazarian Center. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all to the first panel of the day, which is on um, Israeli and Zionist history. Before we get started in earnest, I'd like to ask you to turn your cameras on and to place yourself on mute if you're not one of the presenters. So on this panel, we'll be hearing from three brilliant undergraduate scholars whose work engages with Israeli and Zionist history in exciting and really novel ways. So first, Jonah Freed from McGill University will present their project, McGill University's Arab-Israeli Conflict, which analyzes how students at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, debated Zionist and anti-Zionism um, after the 1967 Six-Day War, often as a parallel or a symbol of domestic political change in French Canada. Then Jonathan Katzman from Harvard will present their project, a dependent special relationship, American Jewish economists and the liberalization of Israeli economy, which charts the import of neoliberal economic policy and philosophy from the United States to Israel in the 20th century. And last, Michael Ross will present their project, The Evolution of Holocaust Perceptions in Israeli History, which traces how six major events in Israeli history shaped how they understood the Holocaust and which demonstrates the mal malleability of Holocaust memory in Israel. So before we get started, I do wanna give each of the presenters just a couple of minutes to say something about themselves. So I have an order here, we'll just go in the order of the panel, but if the presenters would like to share just a little bit about themselves, about their interests, now would be a time to do that before we move on to the panels. So perhaps Jonah Freed, if you could just share a couple of things that you'd like the audience to know about you. Uh, sure. Hello everyone, uh, bonjour, as we say in Quebec. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Avery and everyone at the uh, Nazareth uh, or <laughs> Nazarian Center for uh, having me here today. Uh, I'm a fourth year history student at McGill and uh, Jewish history is really my passion, my specialty. It's what I'm essentially concentrating in at McGill. And uh, I've seen how the Arab-Israeli conflict really continues to shape McGill's student atmosphere. And I hope to uh, explain that some more in my presentation. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Katzman. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan. I'm a recent graduate of Harvard. I guess you can say now I, I studied history. I don't study history anymore, um, but I focused a lot um, on Israeli history um, during my time in school. And um, I wrote a senior thesis, which was the culmination of sort of all my work as an undergraduate um, on the Israeli economy. And uh, I'm really excited to share that with you today. Thank you. Perfect. And then Micah. Hi, everyone. My name is Micah Ross. I'm a rising junior at Emory University, I'm originally from Oakland, California. I am a double major in Middle Eastern studies and Arabic. And I'm very interested in Holocaust education as well as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so in my presentation, I'll be uh, tracing the evolution of kind of Holocaust perceptions within the Israeli historical context. Perfect. Well, it's wonderful to be here with you all. All of your work is extremely impressive, and I very much look forward to hearing your presentations and sharing your work uh, with the audience as well. Uh, before we get started to the presentations, though, I do want to quickly explain to the audience how the panel is going to work. So in just a few moments, I'm gonna turn it over to the scholars for their presentations. They're each gonna have 10 minutes for their presentations. As they present, um, please jot down to yourself any questions that you might have, because you'll get a chance to ask at the end of the panel. After all three of the presentations, we're going to hear from our discussant, uh, the UCLA Nazarian Center's postdoctoral fellow, Professor Alon Tam. Uh, Professor Tam will respond to the presentations with his comments on all three papers after which we will open up for an audience Q&A. And we're gonna conclude this panel at around 10.10 10 a.m. And then there'll be a 10 minute break before the next panel starts. So without further ado, I do wanna hand it over to our first presenter of the day, uh, Jonah Freed. Wonderful, commence. All right, uh, hello everyone. Thank you again for having me today. I'm a fourth year history student at McGill, like I said and I'm researching the Gill's Arab-Israeli conflict, the origins of the issue on campus. Uh, just a brief roadmap of my presentation. I'm gonna go into the background, uh, the beginnings of the um, anti-war movement, rather the anti-Vietnam War movement, how the Six-Day War uh, divided this diverse coalition 
uh, Quebec's Quiet Revolution, which I'll explain later, of course, uh, anti-Zionist activism at McGill and its relationship to the Quiet Revolution, the October Crisis, which was the uh, seminal event of the Quiet Revolution, and Operation mcgill Francais, which was a uh, <laughs> protest at McGill that I will explain uh, much later. So why is McGill so fixated on the Arab-Israeli conflict? That's something I've often had to ask myself. Um, Every time I walk to class in the morning, I pass this mural, which you can see on the screen, <laughs> that says Palestine Libre, which means Free Palestine. Um, this really sets the tone for McGill's uh, student political climate. Um, without <laughs> getting too political, uh, the issue is very relevant to uh, student discourse. It comes up at our referenda, our elections, and so on. So I asked myself, why? And uh, where did all this come from? It had to start somewhere. And I started researching the topic in a history seminar, which was actually the history of McGill, where I had the opportunity to uh, dig deep into McGill's archives, the institutional archives. So I found that the um, answer to this question of where did it all begin is actually quite simple. It started in the 1960s uh, during the Vietnam War. The anti-war movement was this broad international coalition that united diverse uh, left-leaning organizations. Uh, you had far left, new left, as it was called, which was this sort of like post-colonial new left uh, discursal uh, concept. Um, and you had more center-leaning mainstream liberal organizations all working together to oppose the Vietnam War. And Jews were particularly involved in this movement. They were uh, disproportionately politically active, at least compared to other minority groups in the United States and also in Canada. Uh, and so this really put uh, Jews at the heart of you know, the political questions of the day, which obviously had significant implications much later. <laughs> but within Canada, the consensus was much more opposed to the Vietnam War. I mean, it's not the United States for one, but also Canada tended to be a much more um, left-leaning country, to put it uh, <laughs> rather abstractly. Uh, and Montreal was a hotbed for this sort of uh, anti-war opinion. And despite this, Canadian companies, um, government continued to subsidize the American war effort, providing arms, raw materials, and universities like McGill, especially McGill, conducted very important um, research uh, into arms, uh, intelligence, science that could be somehow used for the war effort. And this was very controversial, uh, to put it lightly. Um, so that's the sort of background before the Six Day War, which was Israel's preemptive strike against Egypt following uh, weeks of tensions. I know I don't need to explain the Six Day War too much to an Israel studies panel, but um, Israel's preemptively struck Egypt after it essentially uh, passed a blockade against Israel. And um, this led to a six day annihilation of Arab armies. Uh, and the conflict grew Israel's territorial mass like three times as it occupied the Sinai Desert, the uh, West Bank, uh, Gaza, all parts of what had historically been um, Palestine. And this was covered much more extensively in the media to an unprecedented degree. And as these images flooded into Western media, um, with, you know, crazy headlines like total Israel victory. The optics weren't so great for Israel's left-wing supporters. Consensus was still much more pro-Israel than we might think. 95% um, of Americans continued to support Israel right after the war, but within the new left, within the, you know, the anti-Vietnam War coalitions, opinion was much more variable. Um, in fact, I would argue, and many historians have argued, that this conflict really split the left as uh, Israel, once the uh, David in the David and Goliath uh, analogy, so to speak, was substituted for Goliath. And uh, the Palestinians were increasingly seen as this um, oppressed people, just like the Vietnamese. Um, I mean, this was even the uh, call to arms put out by many activists of Vietnam and Palestine, one struggle, many fronts. Um, slogans like that were actually increasingly common. But Quebec's a very special case because Quebec was undergoing its own uh, nationalist struggle, which Americans may not be so familiar with. <laughs> uh, I'm actually an American. I'm an international student at McGill. But the uh, short story is that 
um, the francophone population, the French speaking majority of Quebec sought uh, self-determination during this period, the ability to speak French in business, politics. Um, they demanded some sort of cultural recognition. Uh, but this movement obviously goes back centuries. I mean, I can't explain all of that in a couple of minutes, but um, it shifted in the 1960s from rather right-wing Catholic nationalism, even fascism, to new left, anti-imperialism, Marxist Leninism. Uh, the same demands, but phrased in different rhetoric, if that makes sense. Uh, and they argue that Quebec was an oppressed uh, nation, just like Vietnam, um, very directly. And this put McGill in an awkward position because it's an English language institution and it was seen as Canada's university. It was a pan-Canadian institution. It had students from all over uh, Canada. And it was really an institutional um, bulwark of Canada's national ethos. Uh, it also had a very large Jewish population. Almost 25% of students were Jewish in 1924, which provoked a controversial Jewish quota. Well, not so controversial at the time, but a Jewish quota, <laughs> uh, which restricted the number of Jewish students at McGill um, at 10%. Uh, and that lasted until 1967, which is much later than many other universities in North America. Um, so at McGill, students began um, organizing on behalf of the Palestinians, as you can see here, the Palestine Society, which was a student club, uh, organized a series of lectures, including um, Palestine and Vietnam. You might see it's a little bit uh, unclear, uh, this bullet number two. Um, and these lectures uh, made the case that uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict was, in fact, just like the Vietnam War, in fact, that they were one conflict. It was one global struggle against imperialism, against capitalism. Um, around this time, Arab lobbyist groups like the uh, Arab-Canadian Friendship League started forming alliances with the nationalist parties of Quebec, for example, the Parti Québécois, which became the most important one. Um, and all this coincided with the war of attrition, which you may have heard of in Israel, which followed the Six Day War. It was a period of terrorism and uh, tensions within uh, the border regions of Israel, uh, for lack of a better description. Um, and you can see here that during this period, the uh, student activism on the issue really accelerated. I mean, even the Latin American Student Association, which put out El Machete, a socialist leaning publication, uh, was writing, uh, demanding solidarity with Palestinians, um, speaking of uh, Zionist conspiracy, and very significantly, student organizations were passing out actual uh, propaganda. Uh, for example, right here, Facts and Series number one, this was a PLO pamphlet, uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization that was distributed on Lincoln's campus. Um, I did some more research into this and uh, the FBI even uh, reported that uh, Arab lobbyist groups, as well as Al Fatah were trying to recruit members within uh, Montreal and other uh, major North American cities, but especially Montreal, uh, to form an international brigade <laughs> to fight against Israel in Jordan during the war of attrition. Uh, so that's very significant, obviously. Um, and uh, one has to wonder how many McGill students were affected by this sort of uh, lobbying. But it's important to narrow our focus to the FLQ, the Front de Libération Québec, which was a uh, radical Marxist uh, terrorist group, <laughs> for lack of a better description. Um, seen here are uh, Salim and Salem, which were euphemisms or uh, pseudonyms <laughs> for uh, two Quebecois nationalists who trained with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine in Jordan. Uh, this photo was taken by a CBC journalist who discovered them there in 1970. Uh, so we have here the Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization and uh, PFLP training activists, uh, Quebec nationalist activists. Um, around this time, uh, the Arab Student Network and Palestine Society coordinated one of the first solidarity or apartheid weeks in Montreal. Uh, they hosted speakers like Stanley Gray, a Marxist and Jewish professor who also was very prominent in the pro-francophone um, labor movement in Montreal, as well as Michel Chartrand. Uh, Michel Chartrand was a radical trade unionist, um, and I'll explain a bit more about him in a second, but at this 1970, it was actually in uh, March 1970 um, meeting, he decried an alliance between Jewish capitalism and global capitalism and identified this dual threat as the uh, uh, reason to be for the uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, FLQ and uh, 
as the enemy of the Quebec people, who he saw as a sort of proletariat. Um, so Michel Sautrand is a very interesting figure, though, because in the 1930s and 40s, he was actually a Catholic nationalist and fascist. He was literally the chairperson for a movement that demanded a uh, suspension of parliament and a authoritarian single executive Catholic regime in Quebec. And yet after 1965, he was a communist. He was a Marxist internationalist, uh, pitting the Quebec movement in terms of, you know, the people, people struggle against capitalism. Um, and he also spearheaded Quebec's anti-Zionist movement, and by that I mean he led the first uh, initiatives to pass South, uh, sorry, Palestine solidarity positions at various uh, socialist organizations within Montreal and Quebec. Um, so he really spearheaded that. And uh, all these events really um, culminated in the 1970 October crisis, not directly, but um, the FLQ, uh, perhaps with some of that PFLP training, <laughs> uh, staged a series of bombings in the weeks leading up to the crisis, uh, including, as you can see, the Montreal Stock Exchange. And then in 1970, kidnapped a British diplomat and killed a member of Quebec's National Assembly. Um, Pierre, uh, Pierre Trudeau, the uh, Prime Minister of Canada at the time, invoked the War Powers Act, which allowed his government to arrest more than 400 um, suspected FLQ members or sympathizers. Uh, very controversial. Um, many documentaries on the subject. I encourage you to watch them. But many people don't realize that they, like the FLQ originally planned to kidnap a Jewish diplomat because they thought this would have a greater impact. They thought that uh, this would provoke a you know, stronger response from the government because Jews are powerful and, you know, money, all of that, all these conspiracy theories that they bought into. Um, and it's important to note that Chartrand uh, bailed out the terrorist leader, Charles Gagnon. Um, he was really behind this idea of originally kidnapping a Jewish diplomat. Um, and the FLQ also issued various pamphlets denouncing uh, Jewish financiers as the enemy of the Quebec people, as really the reason why French wasn't spoken, why the Anglophone elite were, you know, all powerful. Um, so you can see these ideological and practical links between the FLQ, the PLO, and Al Fatah. Um, seen here are some photos of soldiers on the streets of Montreal. In the United States, we might not learn about it, but it was a very significant moment in Canada's history. Um, and so it's important here to take a step back a year before the October crisis, because obviously that was the um, ultimate point of the Quebec nationalist movement. It really uh, ended radical violence support for the French nationalist cause. But at McGill, you had a similar crisis. Um, Stanley Gray, again, that Marxist uh, lecturer, was dismissed for his activism. And that led 10,000 people to protest in front of McGill University. Uh, and they were met by policemen and counter protesters, some of them singing uh, God Save the Queen. Um, to demand that McGill become French and pro-people, pro-worker. Um, Stanley Gray even said that he wanted the faculty management to be renamed to the uh, Faculty of Labor. <laughs> um, so this was an extremely significant moment in McGill's history. And student union executives, most of them were Jewish, by the way, as well as Hillel, denounced this event as authoritarian, as national, or sorry, uh, narrow nationalism. Um, and they highlighted the fact that figures like Michel Chautrand were very involved in uh, coordinating this operation. Um, so that's sort of a direct link to um, the anti-Zionist movement within Quebec. Um, seen here are police officers and uh, students or other Montrealers protesting to make McGill French, right? Um, but perhaps it would be reductionist to overstate this anti-Zionist connection. But it's worth reminding ourselves that a month before Operation Miguel Francais, right, that's in March, in February, there was a similar anti-McGill demonstration in which protesters said death to the Jews, the Nazis are not criminated enough Jews, and really identified um, McGill as this locus for Jewish money, Jewish power in Montreal and in Quebec, and therefore as the enemy of the Quebec sovereignist movement, sovereignist meaning uh, pro-separation, pro-Quebec independence. Um, and really as the enemy of, you know, uh, oppressed people internationally, they did phrase their arguments in those new left uh, internationalist terms. Um, and obviously, again, uh, Chatron's role in this should be emphasized because he was such a prominent anti-Zionist, former outright anti-Semite when he was a fascist. Um, that, that's very significant here. Um, so from all of this, I've concluded that Miguel Francais was not just about Miguel's language. Similar to the October crisis, this was not just about French, not just about the fact that Quebec was forced to conduct things in English. <laughs> it was about class. It was about social power. 
It was about what McGill stood for as a capitalist, uh, imperialist institution, as in the eyes of these uh, French nationalists, as this uh, bastion for um, pro-money uh, elitist sentiment within Quebec, and therefore as the enemy of the Quebec nationalist movement. Um, and in this way, they saw their cause as one and the same with the Palestinians. Solidarity was not just a means of um, political allyship, but literally they thought that they were fighting the same fight. If the Jewish financiers in Montreal were the enemy in Quebec, the Israelis were the enemy in Palestine, but it was one broad international uh, movement against a all-powerful elite, a Zionist conspiracy. I mean, that's literally what they said, international Zionist conspiracy. Uh, so in this way, Palestine, Quebec, and Vietnam were seen as one front, the third world, against a trifecta of United States imperialism, Canadian imperialism, British imperialism, Israel, and McGill. Uh, so Operation McGill Francais is really this uh, high point of radical politics at McGill. And I think uh, we can use this to really analyze how the Arab-Israeli conflict became so important on campus because it illustrates the uh, extent to which anti-Zionist characters like Michel Chalpond and anti-Zionist ideas, or at least um, internationalist ideas that were often synonymous with anti-Zionist ideas, become embedded in the Quebec nationals conscience and therefore as a polemic against McGill. Uh, and perhaps for that reason, the Arab-Israeli conflict continues to be so uh, dominant in Quebec more broadly, but also at McGill because it uh, was so central to some of this uh, pro-Quebec separation nationalism and rhetoric. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Really grateful for this opportunity to speak. Uh, look forward to answering questions on the subject. Thank you so much, Shona, for that incredibly rich and detailed presentation on a history that I personally knew very little about, but speaks to so much, I think, of global history at that time, the campus at that time, the new left, Zionism, anti-Zionism. Really incredible stuff and uh, fantastic images also that you were able to show us, really evocative. And our next presenter on this panel is Jonathan Katzman. So the floor is yours. I'm Jonathan Katzman, um, and I'm presenting about my um, senior thesis, which is titled um, A Dependent Special Relationship, Jewish-American Economists and the Liberalization of the Israeli Economy. And I want to start with this chart because this chart is really important. Um, it shows some of the biggest changes in the Israeli economy over the past um, few decades. And what we see here is in the, not do you guys see my mouse when I'm moving it? Okay, great. We see here in the, in the 1980s um, is that Israel is spending nearly 60% of its GDP um, in terms of government spending. And this is um, amongst some of the greatest government expenditure um, in the world. Um, so this Israel in the 1980s is um, you know, still very connected with its labor Zionist socialist roots um, and has very high social spending, very high military spending, and over time, we see um, there are extensive budget cuts. And eventually, we come down to a reality today where Israel spends around 40% of its GDP. Uh, the Israeli government spends around 40% of its GDP, um, which is pretty typical um, for a developed country. So this story is one of Israeli convergence. You know, in the 1980s, this is a very a bloated, um, government that um, is pretty different than um, a lot of the other, um, a lot of Western governments, if you, I don't know if you want to call it Israel Western, um, a, lot of, a lot different than, other, than Western governments, and then slowly over time we're converging um, to be more like the rest of the world. Um, and behind these numbers, behind the scenes, there's a whole types of political economic changes that are going on. So uh, this is a poster for the Histad Drut, the Israeli trade union, um, in the 1950s and 60s, this was one of the most powerful organizations in Israel. And uh, throughout the decades, they've lost power um, slowly today, still an important institution in Israel, but a shadow of its former self. Um, and here's our good friend Bibi um, holding up a, um, a chart that shows the growth of large multinational um, corporations um, that operate in Israel. So Israeli society has changed a ton. Um, and when I was 
thinking about my research this year for my senior thesis, that was really the central question was why, how did this happen? How, like budgets don't get slashed on their own. So who did this? Why did they do this? That was really what drove my thesis research and kind of an implicit question within that is how do ideas spread from one place to another? Um, liberalism, the idea um, is in, in like economic liberalism as in um, a belief in sort of smaller governments more broadly, less government spending and more um, free markets um, is an idea that really gained traction in the United States um, and then it spread to Israel. So how did it spread to Israel? Those were the questions I was thinking about. Um, so I spent hours and hundreds and hundreds of hours researching this and I'm gonna try to distill a few key learnings that um, I picked up uh, throughout my research. And the first thing really surprised me, um, which is that a few American economists are responsible, I think, I argue, that, the, that these people are largely responsible for the shift um, to liberalism. And um, Israel is a small country and a few people can make a very big impact. And we're gonna talk about these people a little bit when I, when I delve in further into my research. Another thing that was really interesting was that Americans had different approaches to the Israeli um, economy. There's something that there's, I kind of differentiate these approaches into soft power and hard power. Um, soft power is about the diffusion of ideas. It's about persuading somebody to do something. And hard power is tr trying to coerce. And Americans tried both methods um, to greater, both of them worked um, in different ways. But I think if we want to talk about the real shift of the Israeli economy and what we saw in that first graph, I think that the soft power element um, is more important than the hard power element. And we'll talk more about this soon. Um, the third point, is about crises. Um, Israel, especially Israel, um, had a lot of very strong um, interest groups. The Histadrut, which we already mentioned, the military, none of these organizations wanted, uh, government institutions wanted their budgets slashed. Um, but so what it really took for was a large crises um, when people were just like, this can't go on any further in order for there to be reform. People didn't just kind of wake up one day and be like, oh, we need a reform now. It usually was a response to some type of precipitating crisis. Um, and the fourth thing, um, which really differentiates Israel from the rest of the world and makes it a unique case study in terms of the spread of liberalism across the globe is um, the connection between Israel and the American diaspora. And um, what I kept noticing is that American Jewish economists treat Israel very differently than they treat any other country because Zionist economists devoted special time to Israel. They visited Israel more regularly. Um, they, some, some uh, Jewish economists even moved to Israel, they made Aliyah. Um, and this connection between diaspora Jews and Israel um, really allows um, liberal ideas to spread from America to Israel more easily. So let's talk a little bit more about the specific um, events and specific research. Um, so in the 1950s, Israel struggled with a lot of different problems. Um, first, it was a new country and they didn't know what they were doing, especially in terms of economic policy. Um, and also they didn't have any money, they were broke. Um, they had just fought a war. Also, they had mass immigration of Holocaust survivors and Mizrahi Jews in the early 1950s and they couldn't pay to house, feed, um, educate all these new immigrants. And they borrowed money and they couldn't pay it back. And that was, there was a major debt crisis in the early 1950s. And Americans had two different approaches to dealing with this. The first was the Mike Sell mission, which was an official US State Department mission where the US State Department sent an economist, Raymond Mike Sell, to Israel. And what he said was, the United States will only bail out Israel, will only give Israel emergency aid to pay off their debt if you do X, Y, and Z reforms, if you slash these budgets by this amount. Um, so that was an example of hard power, coercive power. Um, they were forcing Israel to do it, otherwise Israel would have to default. 
Um, and that was pretty effective in terms of, you know, getting Israel to make changes, but those were very short-term changes. Another approach um, was, which was taken by <clears throat> um, Jewish American philanthropists was founding um, institutions of economic research in Israel. So the Falk Project was a project that was founded by, <clears throat> it was funded by American economists, um, I'm sorry, American philanthropists. And they put this guy, Don Patinkin, who had a PhD from the University of Chicago in economics and then made Aliyah to Israel in 1949. They put him in charge. And eventually um, Patinkin ends up founding the, um, the economics department at Hebrew University. Um, Israel had never had an economics department before Patinkin founded the one at Hebrew University. And he taught every single class and basically every single Israeli economist from the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s was a student of Don Patinkin. He was the father of Israeli economics and he based it largely on um, the education that he got at the University of Chicago. So here's the story. So first, Patinkin develops um, the, the centers of economic research and teaching. And then um, Patinkin's students, they grow up and they start to enter important policy roles in the Israeli government. Let's put a pin in this for a second as we talk about the 1980s. And what happens in the 1980s is a major Israeli crisis. Um, the hyperinflation of the 1980s, today in America, we're complaining about 8% inflation. The Israelis in the 1980s would have laughed at us. They were experiencing you know, 300%, 400% inflation. Um, and this was a major struggle that, that the country was going through. Um, and what came out of this was the 1985 stabilization plan. And the stabilization plan was put together by two groups. The first was um, a group of visiting American economists sent by US Secretary of State George Shultz. He sent um, economists like this guy on the left, uh, Stanley Fisher, um, and a few other economists to Israel to advise the government to make a plan to deal with this crazy inflation. Um, and they partnered with an Israeli team of economists who all happened to be um, students of Don Patikin. Actually, they don't just happen to be students of Don Patikin. Basically, all Israeli economists are students of Don Patikin in the 1980s. So um, that's just who they were. Um, and they create this plan, which is pretty radical. It slashes budgets um, across the government, social, military. Um, it also does things that the Israeli government has never done before. It institutes mandatory wage decreases against um, in opposition to the Histad group's wishes. Um, and this is a plan that is to totally reorganize um, the Israeli economy and make it more liberal. Um, and um, Israel with its back on the wall, Shimon Peres calls an emergency cabinet meeting on June 30th, 1985. The meeting goes on for 20 hours as Peres convinces members of his cabinet to vote for this plan that was put together by um, this team of American Israeli economists and they by and large approve it. And as a result, we see um, Israeli public debt, um, which was a real crisis in the 1980s has um, totally, the crisis has totally abated and um, Israel is, is solvent. Okay, so let's just kind of talk about where we were. So first we have Patinkin students, they enter um, these roles in the government. And then we have this major precipitating crisis 1984-85 inflation um, and the debt crisis. And then we have this team of American economists come in and they work together with Patinkin students and they create this plan that totally changes the Israeli economy forever. Um, and just kind of looking at what happens like this is it's really interesting to see sort of the long-term developments, the seeds that were planted in the 1950s when certain um, Jewish American philanthropists gave money for economic research end up having this really long-term effect where all the way in the 1980s, um, we see um, this stabilization plan come into effect. And also what's fascinating is just how important America is in this story. Um, almost all of the liberal forces pushing this story forward are coming out of the United States. Um, so I also wanna talk about some pushback that Americans got. Um, it wasn't always 
green lights. Um, so this is a, a funny cartoon. This is Dosh, um, a popular kind of Israeli um, national. He represents Israel. Um, and he's asking, hey guys, stabilization. And these are the Americans and they're hearing, you know, we should deregulate, we should do deregulation, privatization, demonopathy, thinking about all these large scale reforms and all he wants to do is stabilize. Um, and I won't go into this um, in detail because I think I'm at time, um, but another example of Americans being rebuffed is Milton Friedman. Um, he went to Israel in 1977 by the invitation of uh, the new prime minister, um, Menachem Begin. Um, they were started out as friends, um, but Israelis really turned against Friedman and his ideas. And um, Begin's involvement with Milton Friedman ended up being a huge political disaster to him. Um, so just a few quick conclusions, broad points that I kind of brought, took out from this whole year of research, which seems simple, um, but I think are really important. Um, the first is just having a long-term perspective, understanding that you know when you're looking at the 1980s, you can't really understand it without understanding what happened in the 1950s. Um, the second thing is nothing happens on its own. I think that sounds very simple, um, but especially when you're talking about things like liberalization, it's this broad term. You say, oh, Israel liberalized. No, people changed the policies of Israel. There were people who were doing things, um, nothing. And that's an important way to look at the world to make sure that we understand, you know, that everything has a cause and understand that people's actions really make a difference. Um, and the last conclusion I really took out was nothing happens in a vacuum. Um, the world is extremely complicated. And that was because I was trying to study Israeli economic history. And I realized that you can't really study Israeli economic history without studying Israeli geopolitics without understanding Israeli diaspora relations. So when I'm looking at the 1950s or the 1980s, if I don't understand the state of US, of the US government's position on Israel at that time, I'm not gonna understand how they're able to collaborate with Israel in terms of economics. Um, and the same is true for you know, Jewish diaspora relations. Um, yeah, and that's my presentation. Thank you so much everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I have to say, as a social historian myself, I really appreciate you economic historians suing the heavy lifting of the things that I just don't have the mental appetite to engage with. But you're touching on what is a really a major topic in Israeli history right now, which is the neoliberal turn, how it changed Israel after the 1980s and the 1990s. But having real historical rooting that you've given us with the 1950s causes of that is really very valuable to understanding how this major topic in contemporary Israeli histories actually came to be what are its historical roots. So our next presenter, our last presenter on this panel is Micah Ross and the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, hi everyone, so again, my name is Micah Ross. I'm a student at Emory University in Atlanta um, and my presentation today is titled The Evolution of Holocaust um, Perceptions in Israel. So today I will be attempting to shed light on how the Holocaust is remembered and understood in Israel. And after researching this topic, I propose that the answer to this question is not static. And it has changed many times within the Israeli context alone. Through my research, I have found that each of the events listed on the screen have facilitated different degrees of engagement with Holocaust history among Israelis. Yeah, we can stay on this slide for a minute. Um, so first, the 1948 establishment of Israel then the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann, then the Six-Day War and Yom Kippur War in 1967 and 1973, the election of Menachem Begin in 77, the Lebanon War in 82, and then I argue that contemporary political polarization in Israel today is reflected in Holocaust memory. So I will argue that sometimes this perceptional shift occurred because security threats reminded Israelis about the precarity of Jewish continuity. But other times the reasons were a little bit more complicated. So we're gonna get into that and explore the evolution um, for each of these events specifically to identify how and why Holocaust consciousness evolved so drastically over such a short period of time in Israel. Thank you, so we can move to the next slide. Great, so in the immediate post-war era in Israel, the new Jew archetype was dominant in Israeli culture. 
This archetype emphasized strength and self-reliance and people who were in charge of their own destinies and worked tirelessly to achieve success. Naturally, this image was fundamentally incompatible with Holocaust narratives. Stories of the Holocaust were a reminder of Jewish victimhood. So the idea that Jews went like sheep to the slaughter, which was kind of a common mantra at the time, grew very popular and brought a lot of unspoken shame to Holocaust survivors. Because of this, Holocaust narratives were largely excluded from national conversation in the immediate post-war period. Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, very much contributed to this culture. He was a strong believer in the new Jew archetype. And because of this, he insisted against the establishment of a national Holocaust Memorial Day, although the Knesset eventually kind of did so independently in 1959. Um, and he refused to participate in or even attend Holocaust commemoration ceremonies. With all this being said, there was one major exception to the trend of excluding Holocaust narratives from mainstream conversation, and that is stories which emphasized heroism and resistance. So if people were talking publicly about the Holocaust in the era roughly between 1948 and 1961, they were most likely doing so through the prism of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising or the actions of Jewish partisans and resistors. When the Knesset finally did make an official Holocaust Memorial Day in 1959, it was called Yom HaShoah Vehagvura, translating to Day of the Holocaust and Heroism. So we can see that even the semantics of Holocaust remembrance at this time clearly reveal prevailing attitudes towards Holocaust memory. Next slide. Thank you. So next I'll be talking about the um, trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1961. Adolf Eichmann, just for some context, was a high-ranking Nazi official, and his main tasks had to do with transporting Jews to concentration and extermination camps. He was what some Holocaust historians call a desk murderer, meaning that although he never, never pulled the lever on a gas chamber, he was kind of, from a macro perspective, in charge of coordinating the logistics of murder. Um, so after the war, Eichmann escaped to Argentina, but he was eventually captured by the Mossad, and in 19, he was captured in 1960 and stood trial in 61 in Israel. A common critique of the Eichmann trial is that the prosecution scapegoated Eichmann for the totality of the Holocaust because he was one of the highest ranking Nazi officials that they were able to capture after the war. Lead prosecutor Gideon Hausner was not afraid of discussing topics completely unrelated to Adolf Eichmann um, because he knew that a large proportion of the Israeli public was tuning in via radio and that for many of them, this was the first time that they were hearing Holocaust narratives that weren't refracted through the prism of, of resistance. So he really took advantage of the large audience. Um, which by the way was also international and he hoped to use the trial as a sort of national and international holocaust education as part of the trial hausner brought many holocaust survivors to testify about their experience in the camps um, and ultimately i argue that exposure to these kind of more diverse testimonies created conditions under which israelis were more willing to accept the diverse array of Holocaust narratives, even those in which Jews were victims and were not resistors. Um, I quote Holocaust historian Deborah Lipstadt, who kind of explains Hausner's intent in her book called The Eichmann Trial. She says, Hausner's goal was to tell the story of the Holocaust in all its detail and in so doing, to capture the imagination, not just of Israel's youth and world Jewry, but of the entire world. Next slide, please. Thank you. So next I'll be talking about the impact of the Six Day War and Yom Kippur War on Holocaust perceptions. I want to make a disclaimer that, of course, the Six Day War and Yom Kippur had vastly different political and social implications in the Jewish state. Um, the Six Day War of 1967 resulted in Israel's capture of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, the Sinai Peninsula, and was generally viewed by the Israeli public as a, as a major victory. On the other hand, the Yom Kippur War was a bit of a closer call. That being said, both of these wars resulted in high rates of Israeli casualties and led Israelis to experience a sort of existentialism about the precarity of the Jewish state. This existential anxiety allowed Israelis to identify with the narrative of victimhood, which they had previously rejected in the context of the Holocaust. 
So in other words, the Eichmann trial allowed Israelis to accept the victimhood narrative, but the Six Day War and Yom Kippur War allowed Israelis to empathize and even identify with it. Um, so because of this, the Holocaust kind of became a focal point for Israeli national identity in a state that was struggling to establish national identity in the context of, you know, a lot of religious pluralism and ethnic diversity. There was an influx of, you know, very diverse immigrants. Holocaust memory slowly began to unify the Jewish people during this time and the Israeli people. Thank you. So yeah, next is 1977, in which Menachem Begin was elected as prime minister. Um, he was the first member of Likud to become prime minister, and his term catalyzed a long period of Likud domination in Israeli politics. So much of Begin's family was murdered during the Holocaust for context, and he himself actually only narrowly escaped Poland. He arrived in British Mandate Palestine in May of 1942. Begin's background influenced his relationship to Holocaust memory. Um, he routinely made references to the Holocaust in his speeches. Um, and in 1979, he actually did make Holocaust education mandatory in Israeli schools. However, Begin was also fond of politicizing the Holocaust, and he often leveraged Holocaust memory in order to justify his military and political decisions. So by tapping into this inherited trauma, Begin was able to capitalize on the Israeli public's most existential fears. And he was ultimately quite successful in this. He was really able to frame geopolitics as though anything antithetical to his political and military policies would threaten Jewish continuity. So one of the most prominent examples of this is in a speech he gave regarding the 1982 invasion of Lebanon. He said, quote, the alternative is Treblinka and we have decided that there will be no more Treblinkas. Next slide, please. Thank you. So that leads us into this next slide, which is the 1982 Lebanon war. This was an offensive war, arguably. Um, and the left wing during this time began comparing Israeli actions to Nazism. During this time, two educators at Yad Vashem were actually fired for drawing such comparisons. Um, and the comparisons kind of came into the into mainstream rhetoric. Um, so it ultimately catalyzed a new era of ethical and moral, moral engagement with Holocaust history. And it's kind of one of the first places where we see Israeli response to the Holocaust become decidedly split between the left and the right, um, which I'll discuss a little more in my next slide. But it's interesting because the Lebanon war did have a major effect on left wing conceptions of Holocaust history, but it, its impact was much less substantial on right wing conceptions of the Holocaust. Next slide, please. Um, so this leads into my next point, which is kind of the modern day. So I argue that political polarization in the Jewish state today is reflected in the differing ways that Israelis interpret Holocaust memory. And this divide can be understood through the binary of universalism and particularism. Univer universalism promotes the idea that the Holocaust was a lesson in the dangers of human evil and, you know, is a lesson to all of hum humanity. But particularism is the idea that the Holocaust was a uniquely Jewish event occurring um, in the larger trajectory of Jewish persecution. Put differently, the universalist approach says that we have an imperative to never allow another Holocaust to happen to anyone again, whereas the particularist approach says that we can never allow another Holocaust happen to us, the Jewish people, again. Um, the Israeli left tends to identify with the former, while unsurprisingly the right tends to identify with the latter. Um, next slide, please, and this is my last one. So in conclusion, I want to kind of end my presentation with a quote from Zalman Gradovsky. He was a member of the, member of the Sonder Commando in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and he was a Polish Jew. He was deported to Auschwitz at 32. Um, he kept a secret diary, and he died at 34. Um, he does a brilliant job of painting a grim picture of daily life in Auschwitz, but the excerpt I want to share with you today goes beyond that. Gradovsky addresses a question in his writing that I think underpins a lot of the research I've kind of presented to you all today. And that is, how do Jews balance the knowledge of the Holocaust with the strength to continue fighting for Jewish continuity today? In other words, how do we balance the past, the present, and the future? He encourages us, Gradovsky encourages us to acknowledge that no matter what we think we know about the Holocaust, we will never be able to grasp its totality. Um, and at the same time, it's necessary to kind of continue moving forward as a people and a nation. 
He says, quote, do not take fright when you discover troubling living infants in moldy graves, for you will find them in a worse situation yet. Let your heart not tremble at the weeping of infants, the screams of women, and the groans of the sick and elderly, for you will hear more fe fearful sounds and see more dreadful sights. Do not grieve for those who have already departed this life. Save a sigh for those who are, for the time being, still living. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Micah, for, an, again, another excellent presentation. It's a congrats to all of our presenters on this panel for doing such an amazing job with really complex and complicated topics, but distilling them into really well-organized and erudite presentations. And now I want to hand the floor over to our discussant today, so Professor Alon Tam, um, to respond to the presentations on this panel. Um, thank you, Avery, and uh, thank you, uh, Jonah, Jonathan, and Maka, for excellent presentations and excellent works. It's, it's really exciting uh, to see uh, uh, what uh, students in Israel studies are uh, working on uh, today. Uh, and uh, to see, as Avery mentioned, such a uh, quality of uh, of work, um, I've, uh, I've 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 been really uh, happy to see uh, uh, to see and to hear you today. Um, and what I will do in my very brief in my brief remarks is. Um, um, point out to uh, uh, the strengths and the uh, contributions that 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 I see in each of uh, your uh, your paper papers uh, both uh, individually separately and and in general all uh, all together and also invite you to uh, uh, consider um some points to strengthen your work your research your uh, uh, your argument uh some of which you actually addressed in uh, during these presentations even better than in your uh, submitted uh, papers uh but uh nonetheless I, I i think these are uh important points to uh dwell on and think more about as you go on with um researching and 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 studying and working more on uh, on these subjects so um what i think clearly emerges from all of these three papers in this panel uh, albeit in very different ways is the place and the role of israel in international and transnational contexts uh, and and the importance really of studying israel in such contexts as opposed to studying it uh, in its own confines as much as it's, it still is and always will be important and fruitful uh, in and of itself of course um, placing israel in uh context beyond its borders also does important work in dismantling exceptionalist views of it for better or for worse uh, so, uh, John of Reed's paper on the implication of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for a totally different uh, struggle halfway around the world in Quebec uh, demonstrates precisely those internationalist connections. It, it beautifully shows how uh, some of the so-called so sovereignist organization in Quebec in the uh, 1960s and 70s uh, framed or reframed themselves as internationalist and Marxist movement, uh, and by doing so identified with the Palestinian liberation movement and especially with its more Marxist uh, elements. Uh, not, not everybody in that movement was, uh, uh, was Marxist, of course. Uh, but this newfound solidarity, the paper argues, also came on the back of uh, French Quebecois mainstream anti-Semitism directed at what they perceived as Jewish belonging to or alignment with the Protestant English-speaking ruling elite in uh, Quebec or in Canada as a whole, um, epitomized in McGill um, and against whom they were fighting. Uh, this is a highly innovative perspective, shedding light on an understudied aspect of uh, Canadian history uh, and the paper supports it with research into primary sources such as student publications, club pamphlets, speeches, and, uh, and more. 
Um, I invite you, Jonah, to expand your research in order to strengthen the connections that you are uh, that you argue are there. Um, first, in the Canadian context, uh, you mentioned that the French Quebecois fought for independence since the 19th century. Uh, so, what changed in the 1960s that made the sovereignists uh, to think of themselves as internationalists and Marxists? And why the connection with the Palestinian liber uh, liberation movement? Uh, you mentioned the 1967 war as changing the perception of Israel as a colonial state. Um, and, uh, um, and, and how uh, it collapsed Jewish and non-Jewish opposition to the American war in Vietnam. Uh, but this needs more elaboration and explanation. Um, you mentioned that a couple of French Quebecois activists trained with Palestinian fighters in Jordan, uh, and this is exactly the sort of tangible organizational connection that I'm talking about that is most promising uh, to dwell on as opposed to abstract ones. Um, you say that at the end of the day, the pro-Palestinian activists were only one faction in the Quebecois sovereignist movement. Uh, uh, so what then I would ask was exactly the weight in that movement and, and are you not running the uh, danger of overemphasizing their importance? Um, I'm also personally intrigued because of my own field of studies, a study by your uh, comment that uh, French speaking Jewish immigrants to Quebec from North Africa had a different role in this story. Uh, I'm really eager to learn more about this. Um, and it is important to integrate their perspective to what is still an Ashkenazi dominated uh, historiography. Um, and finally, in order to strengthen this idea of connections and placing Israel in larger context, um, I would ask you, what do we know about what Israelis and Palestinians thought or did about all of this, if anything. Um, Jonathan Katzman's uh, paper also furthers the approach of putting Israel in larger historical context, this time in a much more bilateral way. Um, it analyzes the role of American economists uh, and especially Jewish American economists in the uh, gradual transformation of the statist Israeli economy of the 1950s to the market-based one of today, uh, following uh, the uh, three uh, uh, historical episodes that Jonathan talked about, uh, the economic crisis of the 50s and 80s, uh, and the uh, uh, changing policies of the Likud-led uh, government after 1977. Um, it is based on such primary sources as archival documents, speeches, memoirs, newspaper articles, and academic articles. Uh, here, Jonathan used them in an unusual or less common way as a primary source to investigate the views of the American academics who advised the Israeli government. Um, I am curious, uh, though, about the use of ephemera, such as photographs, drawings, pamphlets, and radio transcript to gauge the Israeli reaction to American advice. Uh, I mean, how do these sources help us to understand that reaction? And why not use comparable Israeli sources to the American ones? Um, this paper makes strong claims of intervening in scholarship about economic history and American neoliberal intervention in global economies. Um, since economic history has been sidelined to an extent in recent decades in favor of cultural history, this paper really recovers an important perspective that has a great potential for original contribution. Uh, for example, the paper dates the start of the American-Israeli so-called special relationship a decade earlier than is commonly assumed to the 1950s rather than to the uh, late 60s. Um, it is also very promising in its investigation of the tension between the Israeli ethos of independence and self-sufficiency 
and its dire need for external uh, support, especially in times of crisis, uh, a need that pokes holes at that ethos of independence. Uh, overall, this paper offers a complex and multi-layered argument uh, about the successes and limitations of US government pressure on Israel, as well as the dissemination of ideas about the economy from American academia to the Israeli one and from there to Israeli policymaking. However, I invite you, Jonathan, to consider an additional perspective, the one about the internal politics of Israel. That is the resistance of Israel to a complete transformation into an American style neoliberal economy cannot be explained just by its relationship with American advisors, nor by its ethos alone. It was also shaped by the internal Israeli political power struggles in which those who have been and still are opposing economic neoliberalization have real political power. In other words, Israeli policymakers were navigating between American and internal Israeli political pressures. Uh, I also urge you to rethink your discussion about uh, American Jewish history uh, in the sense that an analysis of the strong personal commitment that individual Jewish American advisors have had toward Israel does not in itself say much about the history of American Jewry. Uh, and finally, I invite you to consider and perhaps reframe better your profiling of what you called who is a good advisor. Uh, it sounds more prescriptive than descriptive. In other words, is this a policy recommendation or a historical investigation or both? Um, and finally, Mike uh, Ross's papers on the evolution of Holocaust memory uh, in Israel focuses more squarely on the confines of Israel, but of course actually deals with the memory of one of the most global historical events of them all uh, and considers the implications and influence of external events on uh, internal Israeli discourse. As such, it is not missing a transnational context, but I do invite you, Micah, to consider adding a comparison with the ways in which the Holocaust has been remembered, for example, in the US. Uh, it will add another layer of understanding to your paper, uh, not just in identifying what is different and what is similar in both case studies, but it can also shed light on mutual influences between the two ways of uh, uh, remembering. At any rate, this well-written, structured, and organized paper systematically traces how Holocaust memory has evolved since 1948 in Israel from suppressing any narrative that could have hampered the heroic image that Israel's founders wished to inculcate in its young society to the ubiquitous commemorating and teaching of the horrors of the Holocaust as a basis for Israeli nationalism. I invite you, Marke, to investigate this last part more. Um, Holocaust memory has indeed become pervasive in Israeli public discourse, especially in the 21st century, uh, even more than, than, than before, and you touched a little bit about this in your presentation. Uh, it really became a moral justification for policy decisions regarding Israel's economy, for example, Iran, it became a way to detract uh, political opponents. Uh, the late public intellectual Yeshaya Leibovitch famously coined the phrase uh, Judo Nazis to describe Jewish settlers in the West Bank. Uh, Mizrahi radical activists, activists today play on the word Ashkenazi to describe anti Mizrahi discrimination. It even became part of everyday, everyday slang in Hebrew. People can describe hyperbolic, hyperbolically, of course, anything bad that happens, like a heat wave or a long line at the store as Shoah, the Hebrew for Holocaust. It became so pervasive that many Israelis today are very concerned about what is already commonly referred to as the degrad degradation of Holocaust memory. Um, so I invite you to think about all that more and elaborate on that last part more in, in your future work. 
And finally, your paper will benefit from considering some theoretical so-called big questions in the field of memory studies. Uh, for example, how government and non-government commemorations of the Holocaust work together or against each other, uh, what have been the various platforms through which the Holocaust has been remembered, um, what have been the political motivations behind pushing or suppressing certain narratives about the Holocaust, etc. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sam, also for your discussions for Marks, which I hope will be really helpful to the students, to our wonderful undergraduate presenters as they continue, hopefully, to work on these projects. Um, I just want to echo what Alone said, which is that these are all great projects that I would personally love to see you all turn into dissertations and maybe even to book someday. This is really high caliber graduate level work um, that can become professional history um, if you choose to continue to develop it. And we are running late on time, but what we're going to do is just kind of to push everything back in the schedule. So I do want to open the floor up to questions. Um, if you have one, feel free to raise your hand in the chat or write it in the chat itself and I can read it out. But we will start the next panel at 1030 um, instead of at 1020. So we have time for a question or two and then we will take a short break. So anyone with a question, um, alert me in some way and I will ask our wonderful presenters. Yeah, Maura. Um, let me unmute myself. So I want to thank all the presenters. Those were really fascinating presentations. And I have a couple questions. Um, I wanted to ask um, the first presenter. Sorry, I'm <laughs> Jonah. Jonah Free, thank you. Um, in terms of the campus environment today and how, how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is viewed, did you end up feeling like like, you know, it's all about anti-Semitism and um, anti-Zionism is, is really rooted in anti-Semitism. Was that sort of one of your conclusions from, you know, the, the research that you did? Um, so, uh, Avery, do you want me to ask multiple questions or maybe just I one and give the person time to respond? Yeah, let's do one and then give a time for respond. Okay. And that hopefully we can okay. have as many people participate as possible. Great. Okay. Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, I really appreciated the French there. <laughs> uh, I refrain from delivering any sort of um, moral judgment like that in this uh, historical writing capacity. I don't think that's necessarily um, my place for this sort of uh, historical analysis. That's something that um, my professor uh, discouraged me from doing actually. Um, and I should say that this, uh, the paper I submitted for this conference was a um, extract from a much longer <laughs> piece of writing um, that did cover many more details on this issue. Um, but to uh, shortly address your comment, there are tangible links, um, as I demonstrated, between um, outright anti-Semitism, like Nazi level anti-Semitism in Quebec, in the figure of Michel Champlain, but also in others, um, and 1960s, 70s era uh, anti-Zionism. Does that mean uh, that they were les mêmes choses, the same? Um, I don't know if I can say that. I uh, am obviously uh, biased. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll leave it there. Um, that being said, though, um, the uh anti-zionist movement has often been unfairly dismissed as anti-semitic um at least some aspects of it um obviously there are anti-zionist arguments that are undeniably anti-semitic um but i do think some of my sources for example um michael fishbach i actually have his book here the movement in the middle east i recommend it if you're interested in the subject um he really um persuaded me to think that uh these Marxist radicals need to be taken seriously in their internationalist aims. They really did see Israel as just one more battlefront in this international war against the forces of imperialism and capitalism. Um, and so when you have these people who really uh, believe that, 
these convictions. Um, and you have figures like Stanley Gray, that um, Jewish and uh, Marxist lecturer that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, when you have Jews like him, uh, I mean, some people would say that they're un-Jews. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you have figures like that, I mean, his parents were, you know, in Holocaust, right? Um, so when you have people like that, you uh, do have to ask yourself whether it is just anti-Semitism. Um, and certainly within Quebec, uh, there uh, it, it's just very complicated. I mean, the francophone struggle for uh, self-determination, to put it um, rather abstractly again, is a very long running um, story. I mean, I can't address everything that uh, Professor Tom said, um, but I will say that some of those uh, links that I was talking about between the Palestinian liberation movement and the Quebec nationalist movement were very, very tangible in a, in a direct way, just like with PFLP training. I mean, the um, Arab lobbyist organizations that I briefly mentioned were bringing people like uh, Robert Barassa and um, uh, René Lévesque, the father of uh, modern Quebec, really, um, the sovereignist movement to their meetings. And uh, he justified this because he thought Quebec was going to be independent and said that it needed to have a foreign policy position on Israel-Palestine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so when you have something like that, I mean, whether or not anti-Zionism in this specific case is always anti-Semitism becomes a very nuanced question. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that question and Jonah for your answer. Uh, we have time for one more question and one short response. Another question. Or, yeah, ask another question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I have a, a question for uh, Micah. Um, uh, and I think I, I expected Alon to touch on this maybe more in case I missed it, but um, the views of Mizrahim always um, on the Holocaust, on Holocaust memory, because the Mizrahi experience has been pretty much left out until very recently, as I understand it. So, um, I don't, I don't recall hearing much about that as you as you trace the history of Holocaust memory in Israel. So I wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it definitely was missing. I mean, it wasn't something I, I explicitly addressed in my paper. Um, and it's definitely an area of study I would love to look into further. Um, I do think the idea that, you know, Holocaust memory because we had all these, you know, these waves of new immigrants and so much ethnic diversity and religious pluralism in the state, Holocaust memory did in general serve to, you know, be like a focal point for national identity. But in the case of Mizrahim, obviously this was not necessarily applicable to them. There was um, a lot of violence again against Mizrahi Jews during the Holocaust. And then obviously in 48, there was ethnic cleansing of Mizrahi Jews. Um, but I think that to my understanding, has yet to be acknowledged to the same degree as um, as Holocaust memory. Yeah, right. Great. Then, Maura, thanks again for your question and make a fair answer. And uh, with that, that is the conclusion of the first panel. So a round of applause again to our fantastic, fantastic presenters on this first panel.